All right, good morning. All right, if you remember, uh, well, you all have your maps, good. If you remember from our last study, we, had saw, we saw Paul and the other Roman prisoners, they left Caesarea by ship and headed for Rome. And as they started out, they started on this 2,000-mile journey, um, they ran into the, what, they, what Luke calls contrary winds. Those were winds that were opposite to them, so it kept them from making much headway. Uh, so they had to sail under the, under the cover of Cyprus. And you can see there, it's the, uh, I think it's the, yeah, the gold, the gold one is the journey to Rome on your map. And they ran under the, under the cover of Cyprus, and then they got all the way to Myra. From there, they took another ship, a larger one, and headed to Italy. Again, as they sailed, the winds did not, did not allow them to go any further than, than Nidus, and on, on the, which is on the very most southern point of Asia Minor. You can see there on your map. It, that's where Nidus is. And um, with difficulty, they sailed south. They went and they sailed south in order to sail again under the shelter of Crete. You can see there where they sailed under Crete, because they should be going straight across, but they can't because of these winds. So they sail under the cover of Crete, and they're, going, they're, they're using the cover of the islands to help them get around these winds and make, make some headway. Um, and once they got along that island, they were able to make it, as you see, to Fair Harbor. We, we talked about that last time. They made it to Fair Harbor. And because they had lost so much time because of these winds, the captain determined that they would not be able to make it to Rome until spring. Because no one sailed the Mediterranean in the winter um, in, the, in those days. They just couldn't do it. Uh, no, one from, no sailing was done from November to March. Well, Fair Harbor actually was not a suitable harder, harbor for them to overwinter in. So the captain and the pilot decided to put out and try and get to Phoenix, which is, that's, I, we, I wrote in there, trying to get into to Phoenix, um, which is a much better port to overwinter. All right. Um, but that's when Paul spoke up. Paul, here he's a prisoner, and he speaks up and he says, man, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and of the ship, but also our lives. And he's telling him we really shouldn't go. I mean, Paul's been in two shipwrecks already. He knew what the winter winds in, uh, on the Mediterranean would do to them, or could do to them. But the centurion, the, the guy who's in charge, he was more persuaded by the captain, which I think I would be too, wouldn't you? Than a prisoner, you know, I'd, I'd probably go with what the captain says. So he's persuaded by the captain to keep on going. And they couldn't leave until the winds changed because the, these northeast winds were, were, were such treacherous winds. But they did change. And they became a more favorable southern wind happened, according to Luke. He write, wrote all this. And they weighed anchor and left Fair Havens and headed on to Phoenix. But before they got very far, a, a, a huge wind called uh, Uroquillo happened and the Uroquillo came off the Crete Mountains and it's like a typhoon winds or hurricane winds and it was just terrible winds and these winds these winds pushed their boat their ship they had no control they had no control over what they could do so they're just kind of at the mercy of the winds so they were pushed south but they were able to run you can look you can see they were, were able to run under the small island of Cloda and then they undergirded their ship with the ropes and the cables. They do that to keep it from breaking apart in these terrible winds. I don't know how they do it, but they knew how to do it. So, um, so they, they, they wrapped the ship with those to, to help do it. Then they put in what they call sea anchors, which had big bar barrels on them to catch the water, to help them slow down, to give them a little bit more control on, on their ship. So, and, and Luke was very good at telling us all about that. So the sea anchors helped a lot, but still they're having to fight all of this on their way to Rome. Well, the next day they started throwing cargo off because they had to lighten the ship, okay? They had to, they threw cargo off. They were using the prisoners to do it. I mean, everybody was throwing stuff off the ship and all hope was leaving them because it was a bad storm. Well, they worked hard for all these days and they didn't eat. They were, they were just, they were working and working and working, and nobody was eating. And um, then Paul decided to talk to them again. He says, guys, we, we've got to eat. He, but he said, he said, listen to me, and this is what we talked about last time. He said, remember what I told you that we shouldn't have left? You should have listened to me, right? 
And he wasn't telling them, I told you so. He was telling them that God told him this. And God told me that, so I wish you had listened to me. But since you didn't, God has spoken to me again. And he, God has told me, don't be afraid. No lives will be lost. Be cheerful. Be courageous. He said, everything's going to be fine, but we must run the ship aground. And so um, he said the ship will be lost, but everyone will be saved. And that's where we left off last time. So Paul has told them this is what they must do. And uh, so let's start in Acts 27, verses 27 through 29. I think you've got that. <clears throat> but when the fourteenth night came, as they were being driven about the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors began to surmise <coughs> they were approaching some land. They took surroundings and thought it to be twenty fathoms. And a little farther on they took another surrounding and thought it to be fifteen fathoms. Fearing that they might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. Yeah, I love that. They wished for daybreak. You know, this is all happening at night. So, you know, this is the 14th night. So it's been 14 days since they left Fairhavens. And they're trying to get, they tried to get only about 40 miles away to get to Phoenix. But they're, this is 14 days later, and they're way out in sea. Okay, they're probably, they're probably at that top loop up near Syracuse right there and, and on your map. And uh, so um, 14 days have passed, and they have been driven about on the Mediterranean Sea. Then Luke tells us that around midnight, the sailors supposed that they were approaching land. Now, he doesn't tell us how they thought they were approaching land, but they, he says they, were, they felt like they were approaching land. He tells us they were in the Adriatic Sea. Now, it's not actually the Adriatic Sea. The Adriatic Sea is that sea behind Italy. Behind the boot, all, that's the Adriatic Sea. Okay? They were actually in the Sea of Adria. I don't know what it is. The Sea of Adria is more around Malta and the southern part of um, the southern part of Italy down there. So it's in the central Mediterranean Sea, but it's near Malta. Okay, I don't know why we our Bibles um, translated as the Adriatic Sea, but that's a little misleading. Okay, but well, we're not. Um, so that they don't, we don't know why they thought they were near land. We, they probably heard the waves crashing on the shore somewhere. So that we don't know, but because they couldn't see anything because it was midnight. So to verify that they were approaching land, what did they do? What did it, take, what did it say they did? Well, they call it soundings, but what they did is they dropped a rope down with a lead weight on the bottom. And they dropped, they dropped the, drop it down to determine the depth, and they found that the depth was 20 fathoms. How deep is 20 fathoms? I'm going to go right there. Anybody know? 120. 120 feet. A fathom is six feet. Yeah, so it's probably in your Bible. but So it's, it's 120 feet. And then a little later, they take another reading, and it's 15 fathoms, so it's getting shallower. Okay? That's, not, that's still 90 feet, but it's getting shallower. So they're nearing land, and nearing land in a storm can be very dangerous. Okay? A ship can be tossed about, but, uh, but rocks and reefs are near the shore, and you don't want to hit rocks and reefs. So they, they're trying to, they're trying to um, do anything they can. So fearing, it says, fearing that they might ru run aground somewhere on the rocks, they throw out four stern anchors. Stern's in the back of the ship, right? The bow's in the front, stern's in the back, okay? They throw out four anchors to try and help slow that thing down, okay? And, uh, and, and so that gives them a little bit more control over what they're doing. All right, let's read the next, next two verses, 30 and 31. Okay. But as the sailors are trying to escape from the ship, they had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the strip, you yourselves cannot be saved. All right, so here we see some sailors trying to escape. They know... This, ship's, this, this ship is done for, okay? And so they, they're trying to escape in that small skiff, you know, that they had on, bo that they had on board. And so they, they were trying to make it look like they were dropping anchors, but they're dropping, trying to drop the, ship, the skiff overboard. And um, now they knew land was nearby, and they knew it was probably to their advantage to get off the ship and not be on it because it's going to crash on the reefs, okay? So they couldn't handle the ship in the storm, stormy weather. They needed to be... In, on land, so they they're trying to get away, um, and the small skiff would be much more easily handled by them, um, especially in this terrible wind. But Paul sees what they're doing, 
And so Paul goes to the centurion and says, unless these men remain on the ship, you yourselves can't be saved. Now it's interesting, Paul's really taking control here, okay? He says, he says Un these, unless these guys stay, you guys can't be saved. Um, Paul saw what was happening. These men were trying to save themselves, and he realized that the centurion needed to have these sailors on the ship to be able to steer and control the ship. So you got sailors leaving. We need them, okay? So he's saying we need these guys. Um, uh, God had told Paul that they would all be spared, didn't he? But these sailors couldn't leave. They needed everyone there to help do what, was, what needed to be done. And the fact that God told him the end result, what, what the end result was going to be, God told him that. But it doesn't mean that some people are allowed to do whatever they want to do and say, well, everything's going to work out one way or another. Everything's going to be good. You can't take that attitude. Everybody needs to do, do their part. And that's what Paul is saying here. We need these guys. So uh, let's, read the, let's read the next verse, verse 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of their ship's boat and let it fall away. Yeah, so here's the only ship they have, the only boat they have to get to get off, but the centurion cuts it away. Why would he do that? So they couldn't get away. So nobody could now leave the ship. I mean, he made sure nobody can leave because Paul told him, we need these guys to be able to go. And he says, God told me this. So he's, he, Paul is giving God the credit all along here, but this centurion is really starting to listen to Paul, isn't he? So the only way that they could keep people from getting off the ship was to cut the skiff away. So he did. I think that's really cool. I mean, that's their only little boat. I would think they'd need it, but have a guard there. But anyway, he decided to cut it away. All right, let's read the next four verses, 33 through 36. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation. For not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. And he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves took bread. Yeah, it's interesting here in Luke's writing. We see Paul. He's a prisoner, right? And, and he seems to be somewhat in total control of what's going on on the ship. Um, everyone is looking to him for their next instructions. Here we see him urging. Now he's telling them to eat. Okay, they've been 14 days without food. I have no idea how they could have done everything they were doing and controlling that ship without eating. But they did not eat for 14 days. I mean, Scripture tells us they didn't eat for two weeks. So I guess they hadn't eaten. But now he's telling them, you've got to eat. We have to, we've got to, we've got to eat for our own preservation, is what he says. Now the word, the Greek word for preservation is steria. And steria actually means salvation, deliverance, <coughs> preservation, safety. And it's used in the scripture to mean physical, um, physical um, deliverance or spiritual salvation. It's used both ways. But here, <coughs> this is not spiritual, this is physical. You got to eat because we got to get off this ship. We've got to be we've got to be strong enough to save ourselves. So Paul tells them that not a hair on their head will perish, and that's then that's actually an old Jewish proverb that um, that they always said to people: not a hair on your head will be not a hair on your head will be um, whatever it says. <laughs> yeah, per will we'll perish. Uh, uh, it's an old Jewish proverb, and he's telling this to these Jews and to the Romans, okay? So everyone was so captivated by Paul, and they were so encouraged by what he was saying that they all began to eat. So that's really cool. So, uh, all right, so they're eating. They're trying to get stronger. All right, let's see, read the next four verses. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. When day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship to it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea. 
while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind. They were heading for the beach. All right, so everyone on the ship's accounted for, 276 people, okay? That's a lot of folks, and it said they all ate and were satisfied. I mean, that's a lot of food, too, for 276 people. So they ate, they're satisfied, they're, 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 they're ready to, to start working again. So what do they do? They start throwing stuff off to lighten the ship. And, and then by daybreak, Luke tells us that they saw a bay with a beach. They didn't really see land, but they see this bay with a beach in there, and they decided to drive the ship directly at it. So they have really lost any hope of making it anywhere but to where to that to that island and they knew they couldn't with the storm they couldn't get anywhere else so they cast off the anchors now when they say cast off the anchors they they cut the <laughs> they, they cut the chains and everything they threw them into the ocean and that would lighten the ship a good bit too getting rid of those the um, but then but then he says they unlocked the rudders which had been held in place they unlocked the rudders so they could have some steering ability, and then they and then they um, hoisted the sail to get the wind, and they are they are pushing that boat straight into the beach, and uh, so uh, that's that's they they've given up all hope of getting to Rome. They got to get to this island, okay? All right, let's read 41 through 43. Who's got that? I've got. It. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. Yeah, now, now we see Luke recounting that the ship strikes a reef. Okay, Now, using the English here, the translation for reef, what do you think of? You think of a coral reef, right? Um, well, the word there, the Greek word is topos. And topos actually means place or location. It doesn't mean reef. It means a place or a location. So this first sentence should actually be translated, but striking, but striking the place where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground. But for some reason, this version says reef, and most of them say reef. And uh, it's I don't a know why. Sandbar. You're, it's a sandbar. Yeah. It's it's ba did you just say sandbar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's what it is. It's a sandbar or a mud bar. That's exactly what it is. And um, <laughs> and I think reef is the wrong word. So I love the New American Standard version. That's what I use. But I think they've missed that one there. Okay, because it is a it is a um, a sandbar. Um, and where the where the where the two things came together was near Malta, that, that island you see on your map there. And investigations of that area, especially around what is now called St. Paul's Bay in Malta, that's where they that's where they, they believe the ship ran aground. So what Luke prescribes here is a, a sandbar or a mud bar, not a coral reef. And then they're stuck on this. They 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 did exactly what Paul told them to do, or what God told them to do run it aground, they did that. And so the bow of the ship is in this bar, but the stern of the ship is getting just beaten by the waves and it's starting to tear apart. So, uh, not the, but the bow is okay. But you know, the Roman discipl this discipline always held that any soldier who allowed his prisoner to escape would then be held responsible for serving that prisoner's sentence, whether it be jail or whether it be death. So if they lose their prisoner, they're going to have to serve his time. So what did the, what did the soldiers want to do? Yeah. They wanted to kill all the prisoners, right? Because they, I mean, they don't want to lose them. They don't want to serve their time, do they? So they want to kill the prisoners so they don't suffer their fate. But the centurion has seen a lot in Paul. And so he, he wants to bring him to safety. So he's going to bring all of the, all of the, the other so the, um, prisoners to safety as well. So since the ship was stuck on a sandbar, and, they, have, and they, they didn't have the skiff anymore. He commanded everyone who could swim just to jump overboard and let's get to, let's get to land, okay? And that's something you, not, that would never happen normally, but it was happening here. All right, let's look at the next verse, verse 44. And the rest should follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought to safety, to, brought safely to land. Yeah, so those people that couldn't, that they couldn't swim, got a plank or got a box or whatever, they were able to float in to shore. 
Apparently there was no reef there. It was just a sandbar and they could get safely to shore. And all 276 people got safely to shore. I think that's pretty cool. And that's what Paul said, not a hair on your head will, be, will perish. I mean, we're going to make it. And they did. Well, uh, all right. So here again, we see that because Paul, because of Paul and God, all the prisoners were kept alive and made it. You know, I, I, wonder, I wonder what those men, especially the centurion and the captain, thought about this God that Paul worships. I mean, think about it. Paul's giving total credit to God for all this. And these are Romans who serve lots of gods. These are, and there are some Jews there that serve a God, you know? So it's his, but, but everything that Paul has said was going to happen, happened exactly as Paul said his God would have it happen. I, th I think that's really cool. Um, God is not only establishing, I would say, he's not only establishing his own veracity, but, um, but he's also building Paul's credibility among these men. And these men are seeking God, are seeing God keep his word. And for Paul's sake, all the prisoners were spared from execution by the soldiers. So Paul has saved all these guys. I mean, they still got to face Caesar when they get there. If they get there, I guess they will get there. But... Uh, but they, but they have been spared from being executed. How many prisoners? I don't. We don't know. We don't know. There was well. We know that there was a centurion, and he, he, he um, was in charge of a hundred soldiers. So there were at least a hundred soldiers on that ship, plus the prisoners. Yeah. So we don't. We honestly don't know. And how it many. doesn't. And it doesn't elaborate on their character either. Not at all. No. no. Not at all. But I guess everybody wanted to live. So. Yeah. As long as nobody was going to kill them, they were all going to try to get right. to land, you know? Like, so the God, but God got yeah. them there, right? So let me ask you something. Why did God bring the bad storm? I mean, why didn't he just let the ship go to Rome? I mean, wasn't Paul, well, I mean, wasn't Paul in God's will? But there's this bad storm. Some believe that when tragedy hits, you know, when tragedy hits, we are out of God's will. But Paul was in God's will. Okay? It's, and so was Luke, I'm sure. I mean, they were following what God wanted them to do. But Scripture, you know, uh, but scripture teaches us God, that God is sovereign, doesn't it, in, in all things. And, and if the tragedies that happen aren't God's plan or aren't in God's plan for us, that would mean that God is at the mercy of some greater power. And we don't believe that, do we? God is the greatest power, right? So why did Paul have such a bad, why were there such bad storms on this trip to Rome? And why did the ship have to run aground? Why didn't it just go, why didn't it make it to Rome? What's the purpose of this storm? Showing God's glory. Huh? Showing God's glory. It is, it absolutely is showing God's glory. I mean, the storm allowed each person on the ship to see that it was God who is in complete sovereign control and when he says something's going to happen it happens doesn't it and he through paul told them exactly what's going to happen he he told the paul let's stay here because it's going to be a bad storm you know and they didn't stay and then paul says well now listen to what god's saying he said we're going to live but we're going to need to run aground you know and they did run aground and every one of them lived um so when god says something's going to happen it does and all this showed them that, Paul, that Paul's God is who he claims to be. This storm was the, uh, we could call this storm the perfect storm, okay? Because it, ca it caused Paul's faith to stand out to everyone on that ship and to us too, you know? But we, we too will be stronger, you know, when we trust in God's care in those difficult times that we all get into. When we get into these same storms of life, we have to be stronger. We have to depend on God more than we ever have. And a lot of us, I know all of us, have had those storms in our lives. And uh, Paul stood out to all these men because of his calm faith in God. And friends, we, have, we, we all have a different, we have a different worldview than the world, okay? And in the midst of our difficult circumstances, which would panic everybody. We need to have a calm faith and trust in God because he's going to take care of us. It might not be as we had planned, but um, there's a very famous lady that teaches uh, in this area. 
Susan's sister Betty, who used to tell Julia all the time and tell her students, don't, don't, don't ever plan your day, you know, <laughs> because God may have other plans. Yep, and it's so true. Paul's, ex Paul's experience of these physical storms, along with being a prisoner of the Roman soldiers, should teach us that, like Paul, if we trust in God's sovereign care for us in life storms, God will use us to witness to the world for him. And, and he certainly will. So, uh, any thoughts or about that? Well, I do have a story. I have a story that I want to end with. Um, that it, it's where this, actually, what happened here changed lives even more. Toward the end of the 19th century, uh, a group of Scottish unbelievers, educational men, unbelievers decided to expose the errors of the Bible. So they, um, they decided to go through and look at everything in Scripture, New Testament, and, and expose how and it was wrong. So Sir William Ramsey did a thorough study of Luke's writings in Acts. And he went down there to disprove every bit of what Luke had written. Okay? But he, he eventually had to write that Luke was among the great historians of the first rank. And he, he, he said that the first, and essential, the first and most essential quality of a great historian is truth. What he says must be trustworthy. And he found Luke to be one of the most, if not the most, trustworthy historians of the ancient world. And through his studies, um, this intellectual man who was trying to disprove the Bible became a Christian and went on to write lots of books. Lots of books. On, he, was, he was a great Christian apologist. He, uh, he wrote books on Acts, he wrote books on Paul, and he wrote one such book that I think everybody should get, The Trustworthiness of the New Testament. And this is a man who was trying to disprove Scripture, and he wrote a book called The Trustworthiness of the New Testament. And all that was because he was trying to disprove what we were just studying today, that that, that was a storm, but none of that really happened. It's just a story that Luke wrote, so I think that's very cool. <laughs> His name is Sir William Ramsey. Yeah. I kind of right. like verse 40. What's that? I kind of like verse 40. Verse 40, what was that? It reminds me of what teenagers do in the spring when they head to the beach. What's that? Throw off their principles, go, run with the wind, and do what they want to. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Anybody else? All right, let's pray. <clears throat>